from Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about the wonders of microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on March 14th, 2024. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome once again to today's Quality Quorum. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 32nd episode of Matters Microbial. Those of you who watch and or listen and who spread the one microbial word to others, thank you so very much. Because of my own family issues, and Microbe TV's wonderful appearance at South by Southwest, there was a little bit of a gap in our, po- in our podcast sessions, but we're all back on a weekly schedule, digits interposed. In an effort to bring in more viewers and or listeners, I'll cut back on microbial stories from my own university. Don't worry, I'll tell you if anything really remarkable happens, never fear. Just a couple of words. Today, the 14th of March, is the birthday of my spouse, Dr. Jennifer Quinn. She is a wonderful mathematician and an artist who works with me on many projects, including this one. She made this fabulous Lex portrait of my late brother Jack using photobacteria, which is very moving to me. March 14th is also Pi Day, and Dr. Quinn has a great piece of Lex art for that. It is also Albert Einstein's birthday. Just look at Dr. Quinn's skills with this Lux portrait. We have put on some wonderful Lux art workshops in the past. Maybe we'll do some again. Invite us. I have always been interested in symbioses, and they are nowhere more fascinating than among the arthropods. So many bacteria appear to be partners of insects and their relatives, and in so many different ways even ants. I am not well-traveled, but Dr. Quinn was invited to give a talk in Panama a few years ago, and I came along. I saw leafcutter ants in the wild, and even purchased this carving of a leafcutter ant. All kidding about the 1950s movie Them, with its giant ants aside, they are a fascinating group. What about their own influential microbial passengers? And what can their microbiome and other partners tell us? Who better to bring some symbiotic enthusiasm to the podcast today than Dr. Manu Hamayo, who has a passion for ants, microbes, and representation. Welcome to, our, welcome to our quality quorum, Manu. It's great seeing you again. I hope Yay. I didn't mess that up too much. No, no, you did great. Thank you so much for invitation, Mart. Uh, I I need to start to say happy birthday, Dr. Quinn. Um, it's such a huge pleasure for me to be here. I I'm super fan of Mark uh, Martin Twitter for a long time now. Now it's X. Um, so thank you so much for this invitation. And I'm always excited to talk about Anne. So let's see what what today the podcast brings us. <laughs> I really look forward to this. Um, You know, I was really moved by, uh, you know, Buchner's book. You've heard me talk about that before, which I can't afford a copy of, but I have a PDF. I may may bind my own copy. But it's so interesting to think about the kinds of relationships that microbes have with other organisms. Now, I want to be clear, despite the title of this podcast, you are not by training a microbiologist, but a cell and molecular biologist. And I would tend to call you a, symbio- a symbioticist. I love it. I this, think- is, this is a huge honor. Like the fact that you are so famous microbiologists think that I am almost there. This is great. <laughs> No, I, 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 what it was so interesting to me is that that's the real development of a field when what you're studying is integrative with other sorts of things. And that's what systems biology is all about. We've had plenty of sessions here. Where we've talked about the role of the microbiome and any number of things that directly impact people. Now, I am delighted beyond words to get down to instead of the thug life, the bug life, even though I'm not using that in an entomologically correct fashion. Yeah, 
Yeah, but I love I love the the joke. Like, are are the microbes bugging the ants or are they helping the ants? Uh, let's talk about this. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful idea, but the first thing is remember that a lot of folks who may be watching or listening, certainly when I grew up in, in Long Beach, California, the only ants I saw were the little tiny brown ones that were m upset my mother when they came into the kitchen, or the big red ones that bit like a you-know-what. So, so why ants? What, are, what do we need to know about ants? So do you know what is funny, Mark? Because if you're sharing these with other scientists who study ants as well, that we call myrmecologists, they say we will all share that the first question that people ask us, it is why ants? <laughs> um, and I think like I saw several versions of this answer in the past. One of the favorite ones for me was with Dr. Carmaro, which is say, why not? They're beautiful. <laughs> but to give a little more explanation on that, um, so it turned out that we have around 15,000 species of ants described already. And we, this number is still like, increasing as we discover with new technologies or finding new ants, species all over the places like savanna in Brazil that we call Cerrado. So for me, the answer is like, why not study ants? They are so much diverse than we are, that humans boring are. So, and the fact that the ants have it all over the, the world, right? We have ants um, where there is human, we have ants around, we have different colors, different shapes, different behaviors. So they're more, much more interested to um, that just look into one single species. But what is fascinating for me, it is how the ants get spread like this, how these ants have all these ecological success, how they are little tiny organisms are doing so much better than us spreading all over the world. And a lot of scientists believe that they have this ecological success because they rely really important functions uh, to their partner, their microbes. So we know now because of like advance of technology, about like DNA, that we can actually um, assess when this partnership between the ants and the microbes start to happen. Uh, and some of them have this relationship for more than 50 million years old, which is fascinating to me. We are talking about a long time ago, we studying like this tiny organism inside of this other tiny organism, which is like, how can I not study ants? <laughs> That's supposed to be the question. So, so I, I wanted to tell, tell you that years ago, uh, I, I had a number of friends who were at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and they were kind enough to invite me to give a seminar. So I came to give a seminar that was very nice. And one of the people I met, I believe he's no longer there, Cameron Curry, did a lot of work with leafcutter ants. And that's the first time I ever saw any close up. And he, you know, I thought there would be like a super fancy setup but it was a closet with a bunch of small plastic aquaria. And it looked like it had leaf litter in it. And he was a very, very earnest gentleman. Very nice to me. Very tall, slender Canadian man. Very earnest. You know, eye to eye with me. And he reaches in and he grabs a queen. Now, I knew from watching a lot of nature shows that the queens become egg factories. They're quite large compared to the workers or soldiers. And so he's holding this enormous looking thing in his hand. And the other ants are very casually biting the you know what out of him. And he is without even looking up, taking them off and throwing them back. He isn't even responding. And part of me wondered, was he trying to see if he could like crunch me? I couldn't tell, but it's because it was just happening every day to him. And it was so fascinating to be able to see those kinds of things. Then I learned a little bit about the bacteria that they carry that help keep their fungus gardens growing. So fascinating. So that's what made me think that answer is a whole lot different than what I used to see on the concrete in Long Beach, California. And I would argue, and I, I you know, E.O. Wilson was, was one of, the, I think, one of the most influential sp spokeshumans for 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 atine for atine creatures, right? Yep. Uh, and it, and it was really interesting. I believe he he's made comments about which is more successful, humans or ants. And I will point out, we do have humans in Antarctica, 
So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we used to have ants there too, Ray, a long time ago. <laughs> yes. Um, so it's it's fascinating because I think the way that you describe, as you were telling the story when the first, like I grew up in Brazil. Uh, so I have so many stories uh, remembering like little kids seeing leaf cutter ants every single day of my life. So I took for granted, right? They are all over the place now. But um, now that I live here in the U.S., I don't see them. But the good thing, um, they, the leaf cutter ants particularly uh, was instrumental for like helping develop my career as a microbiologist, as a my, um, myrmecologist. Um because I end up working with a professor in university as like my first undergrad uh, fellowship. And uh, this professor, Dr. Odair Correa Bueno, he has more than 500 colonies of leafcutter ants in the lab. So as you describe all the aquarium, like with tubes, one of the colonies that he has was 17 years old. Means that it's just one queen living for more than 17 years old and producing this huge like amount of other workers. Um, so all our training was take care of those colonies every single day. So I need to feed them, we need to clean them. And that by getting like closer and closer to them, we can start to observe like the first step for the science progress, right? Like we need to observe our organism and look how they behave in nature, in lab. So I start to get fascinated I start to as I start to learn more about them. So I remember to know, okay, it's just ants, just females in the colony. What is such a nice organism to be a woman scientist, right? To study. So <laughs> and then you said, wait, do they actually don't feed uh the leaf cutter ants that you if you visited Brazil or Panama, you may see the leafy cutter ants holding like the leaves. But it's fascinating that these leaves is actually feeding the fungi. So the ants actually eat the fungi. So they need to like, it's agriculture is the first example of agriculture. Mm -hmm. So once you discover this, was like, why not study ants? Like, this is so cool. But it is great. Once that I start to have this other look for the little things that are in our backyard forever, uh, but now with the scientific line, lens, right, the scientific perspective, I end up like, you know what, that could be a career. Um, and I'm very pleased that I end up choosing, like, starting to learn more about them because once that I look to look at ants, I start to look to carpenter ants or the acrobat ants. Or the fire ants, and I didn't stop yet. <laughs> you know, this may not be relevant right now. Do you know about raspberry ants? Uh, I don't know about the raspberry ants, but you know what's happened? A lot of like English um, mm. get in the way. The way that I talk about that in Portuguese is different. But if you tell me the genus of ants, I probably will know. <laughs> So the reason I bring it up, it's an invasive ant in Texas that appears to be attracted to electrical wiring. Oh, there's plenty now, that you can do that with me. I don't know if it's the electricity or the vibrations because of alternating current in the wires. The um, but it's a fascinating thing to think about because there, there are some old poems. I don't know if you ever read this uh, about where ants learn to actually eat steel. Have you read this poem? By, oh, by, I, I believe. didn't. You should send me. Yeah. I, I, I will. I, and I'll, po I'll post a link to it. Uh, it has that light where they um, pry from its jaws the bright crumb of steel. So oh. the point I brought from that is that the ants were here for how long? Ants, 150 million years old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, they're going to be here later. And so if you're like a science fiction nut like me and you watch those pretty terrible. By the way, I have to say 1954, I believe it was the movie then they, they, they do this awful thing because it was a very sexist time where the woman calls herself a lady myrmecologist, which is hysterical to me. But see, the difference is she's screaming and running away from the giant ant. You would be running toward it to study totally. it. Yeah. Like so easy to collect DNA of this huge <laughs> ant. So I would definitely run towards too. <laughs> yeah. I, I also know for the listeners and viewers, they can't get that big because of oxygen and about the inverse square rule. With But, but I tell you, if ants got a foot long, they'd rule the planet. 
Oh yeah, they are already doing that being tiny. <laughs> Right. So yeah. so I think this is very interesting. You know, a lot of people talk in biology that they like to study something called a charismatic vertebrate. Well, this is a charismatic invertebrate that everyone has some kind of connection to one way or another. City kids, country, country people, people who live, you know, far south, far north. Most everyone who's been where people are have seen ants. So what a wonderful subject for your work. Exactly. And like one that I was studying decided, okay, I know ants, what kind of scientist that I want to be, right? I, I know that I choose ants first. For me, it was a, per, a perfect need to discover that I always love like DNA, uh, DNA extraction. And a lot of like people that are training and, and to be an entomology doesn't have much that time or the training to get like master on these techniques. So for me, it was perfect niche. Okay, I like the ants, but I want to be a cell and molex scientist. So, and then it was a perfect niche when I was like, you know what? What about the microbes? Because just like 90% of, 99% of the microbes that we know they are there, they are not culturable. Mm -hmm. But if you assess them by like molecular biology, by the DNA, you can start to have a sense what they are. What is their function or the consequence for having them? So for me, I was like, you know what? I like ants. I like the like the molecular techniques, and I should learn about bioinformatic now. And that's what I'm doing uh, as a professor now, assistant professor in Westchester University. So it was a nice story, like the perfect. The the I feel that our field is always changing, and uh, myrmecology where it is a myrmecology field it is a very good very welcome um, field to be a scientist uh, where we are thinking about diversity a lot and, and making huge change in the way that we want the future of our community. So for me, like being Brazilian um, woman and myrmecology who has this technique, who want to master this technique, but I still keep the little ants as a part of passion was perfect. <laughs> I noticed, in fact, that you, uh, just as I am am wearing a tie with Petri oh. dishes, Michelle Banks. Love it. Um, so, you are wearing. Yeah. I see, so, I see an ant necklace. I see an ant shirt. Oh, would you look at that? It's an ant earring, too. So, it you know, it's funny. I think when we, in the member, in the member college community, I would say maybe uh, 12, 13, 14 years ago, just one person will show up with something like that. But like this person just show up the first using, like in the next meeting, like become a huge thing. So now uh, when we get it together every other year, that's how the Mermaid College community uh, work, like the, the big conference, we all share this kind of thing. So I just got these last year in uh, Amazon, like the last Mermaid College meeting was in Amazon. And then other scientists, like uh, Dr. Andrea Lucky for University of Florida, she got, Manu, I have an ant earring for you. And then we are starting to share with this. So now everyone that works in ants' world has a thing. And we all have tattoo with insects, right? We all have, like, I think Corey was the first one who put, like, a lot of insects. Yeah. And I don't have any tattoo because I can't choose what species that I want to tattoo. Maybe I should tattoo all the 16,000. <laughs> well, that would be something to go for. Right? I'm but, surprised you don't have a line of ants going around your arm. Right. I should. Right? And and again, I always want, I always, like, I have any tattoo. I feel that I didn't have much time between moving to countries, starting a new lab, have a little kid, you know, didn't have much time to think that through. But I do want to have the hardest thing for me will be which ant. People argue like you should go with Jacetan, that it's a huge one, beautiful one that I had a chance to study. Other like start with liver kind of ants. So everyone has an opinion. Maybe we should ask for people listening today. Do you have a favorite ant? What should ants that I should like do my first time? Don't, don't leave it up to them. I promise no. you. So what's interesting here, and I can't emphasize this enough, is the role of enthusiasm in science. And 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 there there was a time where scientists were portrayed as as men with glasses, without much hair, <laughs> in lab coats, who talked in a monotone like this, which has never really been the case. But that's what the media did. 
And so what we're learning is the representation of science has to be personal. And honestly, even though for some people, my own enthusiasm is a bit much, I was once accused of being too Markish. But, but what I have to tell you about that is at least it's genuine. And what I find is students anyway appreciate that honesty if it comes from a, from a real place. So this is why I'm excited to see the work you do and the inspiration that you will give to so many students. W what I would like to do, if you don't mind a little bit, is talk about the micro the influential passengers. Let's and for the listeners and listeners and viewers, one of the really interesting things you'll find about arthropods and insects in particular is the role they have with intracellular bacteria. Now this, I'm not talking about necessarily their microbiome, and I know Manu will tell us a little bit about that, but there are also bacteria that are on the road to becoming organelles, and they take over functions. For example, many aphids have an intracellular uh, partner called Buchnera, which is actually making tryptophan, the amino acid tryptophan, because plant sap is quite low in nitrogenous compounds. So this is all beautiful ways of thinking it. Then there's our good friend Wolbachia, which Ed Yong, the science writer, has declared to be the most successful pandemic on the planet. 80% of arthropods. Um, and, it has a, and it has a panoply of different kinds of effects from things involving um, male killing that that always makes me a little nervous to say, but but you know exactly what I mean, to things that involve with uh, uh, making sure that you, you can only pass along the particular um, organism vertically, et cetera. That's not what this topic today is about, but it's a little bit of background because you have two different areas that I think are interesting. And the first is the microbiome that you see in ants and different types of ants and the possibility of, of using Wolbachia itself, which is endlessly fascinating to me. So Volbachia for me was one of the, it's a, it's a first love story. When I heard about Volbachia and I learned that a lot of insects has Volbachia, I said, okay, ants should have Volbachia too. And then I found this huge literature, beautiful papers that I was already uh, being published, but that happened about my master's. So I started to study Volbachia when I was a master's student yet there in Brazil. And for me, what is still got me fascinated by the time and still puzzles me today, it is like for other organisms like Drosophila, we know uh, the consequence for having Volbachia, like Mark just described, right? Parthenogenes, uh, pushing towards to females in the population. Uh, but ants are already female, right? The majority of the ants colony are female. So what is the reason or what is the consequence for the ants have Volbachia and have like a lot of ants have like 80, 70% of the entire colony has Volbachia, which is incredible. But we still don't know, and we still don't know yet, what is the consequence or what Volbachia is doing in ants. So this uh, started to fascinate me. And the first step um, for to study the consequence was, okay, it is just one kind of Volbachia. What is the diversity of Volbachia associated with ants? And then... We still don't know the answer again because they're not the ants, even in ants, are quite diverse. So we, you have like a group of bacteria with it's quite diverse and a group of hosts that is the ants that is quite diverse. How can you like, it's not a simple answer like say, this is what they're doing. They're just towards to female in the population. That's what we already know that it's not what it's doing on ants. But they're there. Yeah. You know, I just wanted to leap in that this is really important to think about. Some of the other symbionts that we've we've talked about, like Buchnera, have yeah. a very specific effect. Wolbachia can do so many different things. It can act in some cases to act as a wasp repellent. Yeah. It can actually make plant hormones. That's the green miners business. It can be used uh, or it can can simply go into business for itself to make sure the next generation has it. Some folks are using that to deal with particular uh, transmittable diseases that like dengue fever. All of these are possible, but it doesn't give attention to what all Wolbachia do. And, you know, the joke is it, it does everything. I don't know that that 
people who work on Wolbachia. Sorry, Seth Bordenstein. Uh, I don't know that they would agree with that. Like but what I, I, but I think that in this case, you know, finding out what they're doing in ants is fascinating. I know in some of your work, you've been kind of using it as a way of monitoring their their colonization of different areas. Um, but do you have any thoughts about what Wolbachia might be doing in ants? No, I don't. And you know what? Because um, so we are just discovering the diversity associated with Wolbachia. Uh, and right now, the like could be that every single different kind of Wolbachia has a different function to the host. So I think the puzzle is huge, and we are not quite there yet to know the answer. Um, maybe we never will, because again, it is a huge diverse group of hosts with a huge diverse of bacteria. Like that, that I would say, if I need to define one of the career's goal that I want to try to answer, uh, but and then I will answer in just one group of ants. What about the other ones? I think mm -hmm. it is way more complicated that we are, that I, at least as a master student, anticipate it. <laughs> Well, I and I think that this is very reasonable because it's it's very simple to do, if you'll forgive me, what I'm going to call bad evolutionary thinking, where you presume that everything has a function and a logic to it, and and that's not really how it works. Mm -hmm. So it's possible to imagine some bacteria as just being kind of hitchhikers. Yep, that's possible. Yep. And then you say, well, how are, what are they doing to make sure that they persist? Well, we have some answers about that from some, but not all Wolbachia. Yep. Yep. Do those hitchhikers give a benefit? Sometimes they do when we understand those, but do all of them? No. So perhaps we, we may be in a place where there isn't one thing genus Wolbachia. Maybe we need to turn into splitters. Oh, yeah. And, this is and definitely. Give them, yeah. Definitely. And when you look at the phylogeny of Wolbachia associated with ants, you will see like several clades. So it's possible that just on ants, we're already talking about several ones, several genes. So, yeah. So what is, the, what is the type of ant that you were looking at Wolbachia in? So I had a chance to look first in Campanotos. So there is Wolbachia in Campanotos. And talking about Campanotos, we need to talk about other important bacteria that Campanotos also have. Blockmania, hold to that. Um, but we, they, I also, we already found also, uh, Volbachia in cephalodes, turtle ants, also gray microbes there. Uh, leafcutter leaf ants, not that much. Look at that. Not that much Volbachia on that. Uh, but again, leafcutter ants are different. There is like 12, uh, 19 different species, um, about 19, uh, different species. So it could be that some of them have, or some colonies have, not everyone, not the ones that I test for. Um, but yeah, monomer ants also have tons of Wolbachia. Could be that test one of the ants that you're having in your backyard. Could be that they can have Wolbachia or not. Do they and, lose and that, the Wolbachia? That could also be the case. And that's what, uh, you, you know, the Bordensteins have this wonderful Discover the Microbes Within project that they, they do with high school and introductory biology students mm -hmm. where they look for Wolbachia in collected arthropods. And, and I mean, that's a wonderful, wonderful yeah. thing because there's so much to see involving yes. these microbial partners and what they might be doing. Yeah. So, but, but again, those are intracellular and, yeah. and, and of course, when you talk about leaf cutter ants, I also wonder maybe being a farmer is a selective pressure that acts differently than non-farming ants. Hmm. Yeah. That's a good theory. We should test. <laughs> Um, turn out that, um, so I, I had a chance to work with Lifecada ants in the like bacteria communities. And in Brazil, uh, we can, there's one species like Ada sexans, one of the Lifecada ants that it's really common for through their region. And I was hypothesizing that the kind of leaves that they cut will drive the kind of bacteria that will show up, right, for their mm -hmm. bacteria community. And turn out that we kind of don't see that happen. Um, so I had a chance, like in Sao Paulo state in Brazil, the, the state that I came from, you can have two huge natural biome, uh, the Atlantic forest, a rainforest, uh, close to the coast, the East coast. And you also have the savanna version with Cerrado. So my first hypothesis was like the, those bacteria will be completely different when you compare those, but turn out that they are not. 
They're not. Like the bacteria is so transient, it doesn't matter what kind of colony that I was collecting. Uh, and that's already for me, like bring this idea what you mentioned, like are they just transient microbes? Do they have a function? Do they all of the ants need the microbes? Uh, I don't think the answer is yes to that. I think like some of them, they cannot live without it. That would be the case of Campanotus with Blockmania, uh, turtle ants with other bacteria like um, Acetobacteriaceae um, or Burcoderiaceae, but not every ant need them. And again, it's a quite diverse groups of ants. They are not doing the same thing. They don't have the same behavior. It's it's very interesting to me when we talk about this because, again, bacteria that live within the microbiome, they can co-evolve and they can be part of and being passed down from generation to generation. Yes, there's the video uh, from Ed Young about how ants and termites are transmitting microbes, coprophagy, right? That's important <laughs> to say. Everyone yeah. giggles. But although cows do their share too, let's be fair. But But what is interesting to me is that the intracellular organisms, they can't be cultivated outside the host. And, you know, you think perhaps we're catching this on the way to becoming an organelle. And that's very interesting to me because the, the, the viewing of, of inside of an organism, inside the cytosol as, as being an environment. And that's, that's really caused a lot of deep thinking. And then when I find out that some types of Wolbachia, the bacteria inside cells, also have bacteriophages, which are going between Wolbachia in the cytoplasm. That means the bacteriophages are being released in the cytoplasm. They're finding new hosts and doing their business there. It's amazing. It is amazing. When you start to tie all of these together, uh, this is fascinating to me. Another endo, uh, endosymbiont, it is like Fulbachia. Uh, and I remember that I have the same feeling that you described. Like, are they becoming a mitochondria in the future? So for carpenter ants, look at how fascinating. Carpenter ants happen, if there is ants, there's carpenter ants. All over the world, we can find campanotos. Uh, and how, like, think about other animals in other groups. Which other animal it's have this ability or these skills to live in the entire world. No one, right? N any other animal. But the Campanotus can. So how Campanotus got there, a lot of people believe is because they rely like nutritional upgrade that they can get from right. the bacteria, the blockmania. And like think about it, we have we need, we as a human species, one boring single species, we rely a lot of parts of our digest to the microbiota, right? Our gut right. microbiota. And same thing happened with these carpenter ants that happen all over the world. They have blockmania, uh, the internal bacteria who lives with them. But that gets even more puzzle when you think they need blockmania just when they are larvae, when they still like growing and development, but not when they are grown up like ready workers anymore. They still can have it, but if you remove, if you treat the colony with antibiotic, the worker will be fine if they are already a developed worker, a gun, a grown-up worker, a grown-up ant. But as a larvae, they don't grow up well. They don't develop like healthy anymore, which is already for me like, this is so cool. And then and then I, I had a chance to study them more closely, looking to the DNA technique, and we saw okay, there's, like Volbachia, you can have several different strains of Volbachia in the same little ant, and same thing could happen with Volbachia, with Blockmania, sorry. Blockmania can have several different, uh, I noticed two or three different strains of, of Blockmania living a single tiny little ant, and probably, if I need to guess, different strains of Blockmania was also doing different things. So, yeah, with this technology that we have available to study this bacteria now through, through the lens of DNA, like the, it's the word, there's no more limit anymore. <laughs> so a quick question. Yeah. Most of these intracellular bacteria that we're talking about tend to focus on ovarian tissue, for lack of a better term. 
so that they're transmitted via the eggs. Is, is that the case for blockmania as well? Exactly. So, um, so that's the case for both blockmania and Volbachia. Um, there's uh, some um, colleagues that are still are trying to assess uh, blockmania, to actually Volbachia to see if it horizontal transmission it's have an issue as well because we still cannot explain all of the diversity. Uh, with ants associated with um, Volbachia. So could be that horizontal transmission has a power to actually acquire microbes there. Mm -hmm. But for, for, uh, for let's say, talk about what one ant that have both of them. Campanotus can have Volbachia and Blockmonia. And the entire, like if you compare the entire my, ba bacteria community associated with Campanotus, you would say about like 95% of the entire bacteria will be just these two, Blockmonia and Campanotus, which is fascinating, yeah. So both but, but, of them are endobacteria, they are acquired vertically. So I had a chance to, in one of my chapter of the thesis, to look, are they both acquired at the same time, do the same mm -hmm. way? Right, so we have a queen who has these both bacteria, and then turn out that we had a chance to see that these two, these those two bacteria, they have a different mechanism to reach the egg yet in the queen's belly, which is fascinating to me. And we were able, very lucky, to like see how the eggs are developments yet in the queen. Um, that they reach uh, the egg in different development stage of the mm -hmm, egg. Mm -hmm. So in the end, they're all there in the egg, which is already pretty fascinating to think. But how do they also reach the egg? That's all their story. They're not competing the, with each other. And, and you'd think that they would. They think they would, but they're right? fine. Yep, yep. So do, do you know who Tracy Sonneborn was? I'm not sure. So he studied protists, which are fascinating. Oh. And in particular, he studied things like stentor and tetrahymena. And in a lot of, in, in paramecium, and in a lot of these, uh, and this was work done in the 1950s, he would find what appeared to be bacteria that were specific for the cytoplasm, the macronucleus that you find in protists, the nucleus proper, the outside. So if you think about it, things that, live in a cell have a variety of ecological niches that they can inhabit. And this business of competition within, if you think about the bacteriophages in Wolbachia we were just discussing, that's a really interesting concept to think about. And, and it's funny because many times we look at these associations in sociomicrobiology as being like martial and fighting. And then we have Margulians that think that everything is about getting along. And, yeah. and the the answer is yes. There's there there are elements of both, of course. There is the element of both. But I think about if you like evolutionary speaking, it makes more sense if you get along. <laughs> yeah, I no, I'm 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 grateful for every one of my mitochondria. I yes. I, I couldn't. I absolutely. I'm I'm delighted with them. <laughs> but 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 this business, you know, we 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 don't have peripheral associations as well as we might, although. You have alluded to some of your work with leafcutter ants showing there's a core microbiome, which is necessary. But then there are other things that seem real variable. Yep. Is that not true? No, that's absolutely true. So turn out, again, remember, but ants are quite diverse. So ants, some of them really need the bacteria. Some of them, not that much. So in a, that ants who really need bacteria that we know so far, and again, there's tons I have worked for my entire life. My students are really happy with that. Um, but some of them, like the turtle ants, there is a core microbiome community. Really, like, doesn't matter if you collect the turtle ants, the cephalodes, on Florida Key, on Texas, or Amazon, or Brazil, Cerrado, like, they all have the same kind of bacteria. The same lineage of bacteria are always right. there, which is already fascinating to me to think about it, right? How are they always there? Um like thinking, we're talking about little tiny ants, um, but they're doing this for millions of years old, so they're doing fine. Other groups of ants, uh, Campanotos also have a very core, important microbiome. Uh, I, we are just discussing about Volbachia, uh, Blockmania, but, and then we have like Daciton, another group of ants that have like tons of Rhizobiales, 
uh, which is also like core microbiome community. And then we have livercutter ants, not so much. So they are more transient microbes. We have others like Phaedolis that again, very important groups of ants happen all over the world, but they don't have a core microbiome that's stable. There's a lot of like transient bacteria. I'm sure that we have some ants that have both, 50% core, 50% transient. <laughs> um, so, but again, they are doing this for millions of years old, way before us, right? So by studying them, and again, they live in society, like they they take care of the broods, like the baby larva, they feed um, the queen, they live in the same house, right? Think about the colony. So they're a nice motto, actually, for us is study uh, and answer big questions about microbiome work. So it's a nice system. I always have ants here in my animal facility. Now I'm my new, um, my new favorite groups of ants for the week. I need to say that because I cannot choose one. Uh, it is a phenogaster. Uh, we are. I'm sitting now in a Pennsylvania, um, very close to Philly, so we can collect tons of phenogaster ants around here. And they're quite like they're beautiful ants. They're was easy to collect them with my students. They were very happy uh, collect ants in the woods with me around here. Uh, and they, we still don't know much about the microbes. Right? We don't know nothing about the microbes of them. So are they transient? Do they have a core microbiome? So stay tuned. I will come back for the second episode about ants and microbes and answer you in a few weeks. So I'm, I'm familiar with the idea that some of these influential passengers, these microbes, can have effects on, say, nutrition, especially with the example you use for the larval state, but not necessarily the adult. Since ants are social insects, and putting on my E.O. Wilson sociobiology hat, is there any ev evidence of a microbial influence on what takes place with the sociobiology of an ant colony? That is a really great question. I'm not sure if anyone ever tests this, but I need to say the microbes definitely take advantage that the ants live in society, right? So because they they share, like they live in the same place, they share food. So maybe the microbes are there because they it's an easy pathway for them to interact, like go along. But are they like are they having beneficial for this or they are actually driving that behavior? Um, well, it, that's a very interesting question. I, I'm fat because this takes us back to the farming idea and whether or not that there's something influencing farming behaviors with this. Because I know, for example, and please forgive me if I don't use the terminology correctly, there's a specialized structure just under the head, or just in back of the head, I should say, where you get this nocardia relative that makes all the antimicrobial agents that they use for farming, right? Yep, yep, yep. So if, there, if, if there's been, I call it Darwinowing, if there's been, been evolutionary shaping of a structure to benefit bacteria being carried, it wouldn't surprise me the bacteria could affect behavior in that fashion, maybe altering feeding behaviors yep. or grooming behaviors. So I, I, I wouldn't be surprised, but as you say, it might be difficult to study. Yeah, but um, so you mentioned about the, the specific group uh, bacteria that it's really important for the leafy ants. But uh, for, for example, for Campanotus and Blockmania, they also have the bacterium, like where it's a, a organ a structure where keep the bacteria there in the gut of the ants. So evolutionary speaking, there are several groups of bacteria that are happening with those ants a million years ago, and they evolved to have even a specific organs to like help the, they stay mm -hmm. there, that being stable into that population. Uh, it's possible. Uh, I don't think no one has, I think it is difficult to test like this because all the ants are social, right? Different than bees where we have like some species of ants are uh, solitary and other ones live in colonies. So that will be a two, um, two different behaviors, uh, right. models to actually test these. And they all live in society. So maybe what we can think about it, like there are some ants, like the leafy kind of ants, they, they have more transient bacteria. So they don't have, um, 
the transient one right, compared to the one that have the core material community. But I don't think no one ever did. So maybe we should do I, this, Martin. <laughs> I, 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 I think the idea of, of doing a fecal transplant on ants, which they do naturally, but if they if yeah. you were to put, say, farming bacteria mm. into carpenter ants, what would happen then? Would be a really interesting question. Let's do it. Let's go to Brazil and do it. <laughs> well, I have thoughts on that. But the other yeah. question I had, can, can, can I ask, and this is actually something that has to do with more population level effects. Yeah. So if you have two different colonies of bacteria that overlap in their Colons um, of ants, two, right? Colons of ants. Ter yeah, two different types of ants. And they're carrying different microbes. Is there a battle going on with the microbes as well as the ants? That's an awesome question. And the answer is a very famous one. It depends. <laughs> depends of the species they are talking about, right? Because, again, it is – like, once we start to study the microbiome of, like, insects – when the technology was like cheap and available for us to do this kind of experiments with DNA of ants, uh, we thought that there is just one rule, like diet affect the bacteria community associated with ants, or where the ants are affect the bacteria community associated with ants. So like, and then every study that we are seeing that have been published, we realize that there's no just one big answer, one big true that run the entire thing. So every system has its own caveat, which again, make our task as a scientist challenge, but also fun. So depend of the groups of ants that will be interacting over like sharing food or sharing the same tree or even like fighting for the same tree. So that will be depending of how mm -hmm. that will affect the bacteria or not. We have some, I, mean, uh, I, I can lose some spoilers. Uh, so we together with other amazing collaborators, um, Dr. Powell and Dr. Moreau, uh, we are able to look two different uh, species of ants who live in the same three, but they are kind of related, like the same genus of ants, and see uh -huh. if they're sharing microbes. And um, we have some thoughts about that. They could share, but not the way that we expect. So stay tuned. There's more papers coming out. <laughs> It, it, and, and if I used to teach a course in symbioses, and one of the things that amazes students is how certain parasites can affect the behavior of arthropods. So if that can take place, the idea of bacteria being turning arthropods into marionettes is not so surprising. So we'll be on the lookout. Yep, we'll stay tuned. Uh, this is already, it has been documented already in other groups of insects uh, where the bacteria is actually driving where the insect should go collect the food. It's not being documented in ants yet. 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 <laughs> it's, it's all about, it's all about like finding new things. And, and, and honestly, um, I've made the quote before, the science fiction author Isaac Asimov, complicated dude. But he once said that discovery isn't when, and he's being silly, some damp Greek gets up from his tub and yells Eureka. What it's from is someone looking carefully at what's in front of them saying, that's weird. Because that really is where, where research and, and, and science comes from, right there. That idea of observing something and then beginning to test it to see what it means. And so this idea of, of, of looking at organisms in, in different areas kind of – and you can actually study. I know the coevolution between, for example, Wolbachia and your ants because you know the changes that take place in their ancestry versus the changes in the Wolbachia carried by their various descendants as well. So all of this is a, a near-perfect system, which I think brings me to a final segment with you here to start talking about, and it's this. You have a big interest in representation in the sciences, and I agree more. I have, you, you know, tons of buttons that say things like this, that science is for everybody, because yep. it is. It was for me. So um, and, and no one, oh, there it is. <laughs> and it's, it's really important to remember, everyone comes from a different kind of background, but very few of us come to science uh, directly because say their parents and grandparents were scientists there are people like that and and more power to them but for me it was i had to know what happened next 
And that's what drove me. And I'm especially interested in situations where you can use a model system, something that's all around you, that perhaps haven't been looked at as much as they might. Yeah, that's you, you know, beautiful. Uh, go ahead. So for me, like, it, it's even hard to tease apart because, so my group uh, that I study in are quite diverse, right? Um, I came from, I'm from Brazil, I'm Brazilian. I came from a country where it's quite diverse. Um, not much in academia world, right? But I am a woman, academia, first generation student, um, and it was quite hard for a long time, like trying to come home and explain my parents would totally <laughs> give me everything that I need. But like why study DNA of ants was important, right? So I mm -hmm. didn't like, and maybe that's the reason that I actually enjoy a lot doing outreach because like daily by day, I was explaining like people without scientific background, why should I continue doing this? And I could have a career by doing that. But um, as I start to progress in my career, um, I moved to another country, which is I, I end up another layer of like being an immigrant in, a, in another country and being a Latina woman here, um, plus like a woman in academia, a parent in academia. Like that's all the diversity that brings always for me. I always like to think that Lifey, it's that nature, it's perfect per se because it's messy and because it is diverse. So, science, the good science, I believe that came from a diverse background. Like, mm -hmm. there's no way that you can try, like, this is so powerful and this is science is so powerful and nature is so powerful because included all the diversity. So why should the just the scientists look like just one kind of way, right? Agreed. So mm -hmm. so when you bring all of this together, it is like that's how should everything to be, right? So I keeping advocating for more uh, an easy pathway for first generation student, uh, more immigrant scientists here in America uh, and actually all over the world, like yeah. No, I mean let's let's face it. We see things better when there's perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and and you know, I've said it many times and I have people roll their eyes at me and they certainly can do that and they would not be the first to roll their eyes at me, but I'll say that we need many faces and many voices. Oh, Historically, yeah. science really advances quickly when different points of view have been introduced. I'm thinking about the founding of molecular biology, which is primarily from disaffected quantum physicists. And it's true. So in a similar way, people from different backgrounds have a new perspective. They don't know what a bad or a good question is. And I you need know, to say, yeah, I totally agree with you. And I need to say, um, the other way also to think about science is the way that we are teaching or treating <laughs> our students. Because... For many years, like now, I'm seeing like the smartest questions, the clever ones always came from the new student coming to the field who like uh, uh, for a long time, us as a scientist, we are treating them like uh, teaching, right? Like, oh, spend my time doing the teaching. But like the young kids, when they come, they have like all the curiosity, all the amazing questions. I always keep in learning so much for the random questions that my students like shouldn't be. So I always think like set up this stage where diversity it's not accepted, but it is mandatory and not have like the vertical um, hierarchy happening in your lab or in your department. Like students should have a voice, always bring more perspective for every single problem that you wanna solve. Rather, it is more like how included more higher faculty, uh, higher, uh, more diversity faculty in our department, or how, how can, why these ants are doing this? Like, it is so easy to lose perspective as you start to bat focus in your career in a very specific thing. But you, when you bring someone from the outside and they look, you're like, I never thought that way. Hmm, interesting. Well, and and, it, and it is challenging. Um, and, and, and from, and tropically um, hazardous people 
older people like me. Um, you, you know, there's this business where you want people around you who think the way that you do. And, and frankly, that's never been my jam, as the saying yeah. goes. Yeah. I've always liked weird questions and unusual ideas. And I was really struck by an idea in Zen Buddhism called the beginner's mind that David Suzuki wrote about. And it's, it's really, Im, Im, uh, excuse me, S.T. Suzuki. David Suzuki is a little bit different. Nonetheless, the whole idea is that a beginner's mind has no preconceptions. And one of the things that I do with my students, and I'm sure you do with yours, I even don't like calling them mine. I mean, it's kind of like a collaboration in a way, is I work so hard to get them to a place where they're not afraid to say the three most important words in science, which are I don't know, mm -hmm. because you can fix that. And then I find a lot of times institutions and organizations have people who all see the same way. And, and that's almost never the, the best way because things are various. They, they, there's so much variation and, and so much complexity. Different points of view are vital and we have to create an environment where they're comfortable. And that's what you've been doing. And you're doing it through the focus of something that everybody sees, the ants. <laughs> yep. Uh, um, I'm going to send you, by the way, links for professional ant farms because I think you should have one. So, I know it's it. I know you don't want them, but it's, it's like with me. I, I have pet lizards. I adore my pet lizards. I don't do research on them. So there you go. See, so I think that's a, I. I think I don't. I never know any myrmecology scientists who study ants who have an ant farm because they know that how much hard how how hard it is to take care of them and keep them alive. We have them to do science, <laughs> to do experimentals in the animal facility, but not in our house, not in our no. like day by day. But but sure, send me and I will take a look. Maybe I can some make some suggestions for outreach. <laughs> Some of them are really complicated looking, which I, I find exciting. I know. So. I take care of 500 colonies of leafcutter ants when I was in Brazil. <laughs> I don't want to have them again. <laughs> <laughs> no, so this please, is a, please send me. <laughs> uh, of course. And I mean, this is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I want listeners and viewers to really understand the role of a mentor who's enthusiastic and accepting and can create an environment where it's okay to ask questions. E even ones that they, and I hate this expression, stupid question, what does that mean? There's no stupid question. There are questions no. that haven't been thought out, but that's not stupid. No. And yeah. I have found year after year after year, if one student has a question, others do as well. And you have to create a situation where people are not afraid to say they don't know, and, and, and that's an opportunity. Exactly. It and really is. And I need is. to say, Mark, not just for our students, like not say, I don't know, but we should normalize this in any like uh, science society because like I, I, like I end up like liking more the scientists that go to a conference and say, oh, I never thought about that. Uh, great point. We, I, I will think about it and I will be back to you. So that kind of like humble, that kind of like energy attract me even more to say, I want to collaborate with that person because yeah. they are really like curious scientists who have the honesty to say, I don't know. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that they can also have the power and the energy to go figure it out later because it I mean, takes a I mean, lot of brave to say that. I mean, life, life has been on this planet for a very long time. And to think that you understand every aspect of it is ridiculous to me. It is. We are spending the so. entire life without not even know nothing. <laughs> but we I, try. I don't... And we have fun doing, so that's good. <laughs> right. And I don't know if this really happened, but uh, the fella who, who helped describe the I, – I was going to say discovered, but it was already there. The lack yeah. operon. Yeah. Uh, Jacques Monod, his his dying words, and it's much more clever in, in French, which I don't speak, but apparently his dying words are were, I am trying to understand. And, and that is such a goal. Yeah. At the end of his life, he was still trying to understand. And I don't want to end on a negative note at all. I just yeah, want to say that that's the, ex yeah. that's the excitement of finding out things that people – I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I have a lot of my students play around with water bottles and they try and isolate bacteria from their water bottles. And I teach them basic microbiology and we do simple 16S. And a couple of times we've found bacteria 
Are you ready for this? Dinococcus. Their closest relative is Dinococcus radiodurans in a water bottle. I also find a lot of methylobacter, and they live off C1 carbons. And I'm wondering, are they living off the plastic in the water bottles? Hmm. And you know what? I may find out that lots of people have thought about that, and lots of people have tried to study that that I haven't seen. That's certainly possible. But it's a great place to start talking to students. Exactly. exactly. And that's the goal. That's science the is a goal. process. Make, mm -hmm. Yeah, science is a progress. And as we are doing science, I hope that you're also answering some questions, trying to understand things, but also making the next generations of science. Thank you. One yes. of the my life goal as a scientist will be, okay, I, I learned a lot about ants as we go. I'm still trying to understand them the way that you say, but I had a chance to have fun and training a lot of great scientists to the field. Um, and that's what I hope. I hope that my Hamalu Lab uh, continued training students, showing the love for science um, as a passionate way to learn and continue to understand the world around us. You know, it's interesting that you say this because um, I'm not the best teacher in the world, and I'm certainly not the best researcher. No. But I'm a pre I'm pretty good talent scout. <laughs> and having sent like literally 26 of my research students to PhD programs, that's a good Impressive. feeling to have. Well, that's it's not good. about me. I'm just a talent scout. I find them. Yeah. And, and, you know, some of them think I'm swell and some of them don't really care very much. And all of that's fine because I was part of that process and it yeah. gives me great satisfaction. Yeah. I know you feel the same way. Yep. And I keep in telling my students here, like when they are about to graduate, they say, don't think you get rid of me. Like you and me, it's forever. I will be forever thinking about you. I'll be forever like, what you doing? What you doing? Oh, that's funny. <laughs> Manu, this has been so wonderful to have this conversation Aww. with you. And I still hope to come out to your university someday, maybe do a LuxArt session yes, with people. Yeah, that would be amazing. Mar yeah, Dr. Would... Martin, Dr. Kim, you need to come oh, here yeah. visit at Westchester University. Oh, she's she's really fabulous, um, as you know. So yes. in, in, in any event, I, I want to wish the very best to your research crew and that with whom you work, not who work for you. Yes, my collaborators. Your collaborators. I still, I still call them my kids because, you know, yeah. like my the motherhood, like put them in a process. So, yeah, my collaborators, but also my kids. <laughs> you, you have to come up with a name for your students. Uh, Pat mm. Schloss calls his students schlabbies, which oh, is pretty funny. I love that. I, I need to say my students are so creative that after uh -huh. listening to this, they will come back with something better than I can think about it now. <laughs> well, I don't know if they can top Doc Martians because that that's that's my students. That's but, um, amazing. Doc yeah, Martians. but I didn't I didn't do that. They did. But I'm yeah, sure it'll be something did. that something will happen like that. Yeah, I, uh, I think so. I, I think they will have some trouble to say Hamalio, but <laughs> They, they probably will figure it out better, is my way to say it. And, and I want to wish your family the very best as well. Oh, thank you. And, and I hope we can talk again soon. Of course, please. I'm fan. I'm fan. I'm keeping follow your career, Mart. So thank was a huge pleasure to meet you in person uh, in 2021. Hopefully we can do again soon. Um, thank you for invitation, like for inviting me, for be part of this podcast. It is a huge pleasure to talk about ants and microbes. You know, we are scientists. We like to talk a lot. Uh, but like doing this in your podcast with you, which I am a huge fan, it is other level of uh, expectation. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. I also wish the best for you and your family and the podcast. Um, and yeah, thank you also, Dave, who put everything together, who organized everything for us and make us sound clever. Um, yeah, <laughs> that was amazing and super fun afternoon. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Ciao. <laughs> this has been Matters Microbial, a weekly podcast about the wonders of our microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes from today's episode, with tasty links as always, 
can be found at microbe.tv slash mm. If you like our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department of the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Manu Hamayo is at, Wetchester, <laughs> is at Wetchester University in Pennsylvania. Many, many thanks to David Renata for superb editing and Reaper Clark for the wonderfully quirky music. I hope you've enjoyed being part of our quality quorum today. See you next time on Matters Microbial.